Hi, and welcome to another episode of Translating Technobabble. My name is Gary Schultz. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Sales. Today, I'm here with Mike Ryan. So he's been working on um, enterprise level uh, applications for almost a decade. That's right. Um, spends probably 60, 70% of your time working with engineering managers on strategy, architecture, implementation. Um, and you're a Google development expert, developer expert uh, in Angular and web technologies. Mike, I'm really happy uh, that you're here. Um, arguably one of the, the experts in NGRX, and we're gonna talk uh, today about NGRX and specifically what managers should know about NGRX. Sounds great. And the lens that um, we're gonna look through is, you know, why should I care? What does this mean to my team? What does this mean to my company? Why don't we just start with what what is NGRX? Sure, so NGRX is very closely related to Angular. It is a collection of open source libraries that implement a reactive state pattern. And I know that's a lot of techno mm -hmm. battle. We'll cut through a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. But essentially, it's a way of building Angular applications that can scale. Either scale in performance, if you're doing some really process intensive tasks, or scale if you're talking about building really real time applications. So it's an optional way of building Angular applications, but it really comes up in enterprise software because that's where we tend to reach these scale problems. Got it. <clears throat> and can you talk a little bit about how, it's, how it works with Angular, how it's different than Angular? Yeah. So it works like Angular because a lot of the people that build Angular have also helped and contributed to building NGRX. Um, it is a set of libraries that you can use in an Angular application but it is different in that it is solving a set of problems that Angular does not, out of the box, have a solution for, which is those performance problems I was talking about before. Yeah. Performance of scale or performance of real time. Just big picture, what, what, is the, what is the benefit of using the NGRX libraries? Yeah. Or the value, if you would. To get to the benefit, I kind of want to tell a story first. Please. A story from my yeah. uh, career background. So in a previous job, I actually worked for the U.S. Army. And to be really clear here, I was not a soldier. Um, I was a software engineer leading teams as a tech lead. But what we had was a challenge. We were building applications that eventually became a mess. They were not particularly fun to maintain. Um, and we kind of coined this term of spaghetti code, mm -hmm. where we had written up sort of this Angular JS application at the time, and it was a disaster of architecture. It worked, but the truth of that application is, even though it worked and it's still deployed today, no one has made a change or deployed that application in like five years. So that was a really good early learning experience for me that, hey, I can't just get to working, right? I can't take a technology like Angular or AngularJS and get an app and say that was enough. I need to spend more time up front thinking about how can I get to working, but along the way, make sure that I have built this in such a way that we can continue to invest in it, to grow that application, and to onboard new engineers mm -hmm. and have them be successful contributing to it. And that's sort of where NGRX was born. It was born in that environment as an architectural solution for building applications like the ones I was building for the U.S. Army. Yeah. So let's now tie it back to the question you asked me about the benefits of NGRX. Why did I come up with this architecture and what problems does it try to solve? And there's this really great white paper called Out of the Tar Pit. And it describes sort of what is complexity and how does it relate to software. And they identify that complexity in code bases is sort of the major difficulty in successful development of large scale software. And I certainly learned that to be the case. Mm -hmm. And the paper goes into this a little bit and they actually have this really fantastic quote that complexity sort of comes from three different sources, state, code volume, and control flow. So NGRX as an architecture tries to address state, control flow, and code volume for Angular applications to help you build Angular apps that don't suffer from complexity. Mike, I appreciate you breaking down kind of complexity in those three terms. Um, would it be okay just to kind of break those down a little further, like yeah. one by one? So let's not make any assumptions. What is state? Yeah. State is, um, can be somewhat of a nebulous term, but we've all encountered state, 
when we've used software applications because state is really talking about the data that changes over time as the application runs. And I said that we've all encountered it because we've all encountered problems with state. Mm -mm. If you've ever had to use a piece of software and something broke and then someone said, oh, try it again, or just refresh the page, or clear the cache, or try turning it off and on again, my personal favorite, <laughs> then you've encountered a state problem in a piece of software where that application or that piece of software didn't handle state in a consistent way. So, so then how, if we go kind of step by step through this, how does NGRX handle state? NGRX makes this assumption that all large-scale software systems are eventually going to encounter problems with the state. What are some ways then that we could try and tackle this? And NGRX sort of tries to learn from history a little bit. How have we built web apps in the past? And what we have learned is that when we bring state really close to user interfaces, that's when we tend to have problems. It's really easy for development teams to build UI applications where state is really attached to what we might call the view layer or the code that actually draws things on the screen. Mm -hmm. So what NGRX tries to do is it separates these two things. And I kind of almost like to say that an Angular app built with NGRX is kind of two applications in one. You have one whole other body of software that's handling state and state transitions. And then you have what you might consider your traditional user interface application. And they're clearly separated, well-defined, and they have a very small surface to communicate with each other through. So how does this relate to complexity? Well, by separating these into two distinct bodies of code, we get some pretty cool benefits. The first is we've isolated the management of state within our software's architecture. And by isolating it, we immediately gain some benefits in our ability to test that piece of code in an automated way um, by making it a small, single module of code, writing tests for just the state management piece mm -hmm. becomes a lot more straightforward than a typical Angular application. By making sure that our UI, our view code layer, can only communicate with that state in a very particular way, we're able to enforce contracts, both using the type system of TypeScript, which is a, another foundational technology mm -hmm. choice in the Angular ecosystem, but also, again, with more automated tests. Mm -hmm. So that's really the benefit in how we're managing some of that complexity is we're saying, okay, let's separate these two modules of code, and then we can robustly test one and then verify that the communication between the two is also well-defined. Got it. Okay. Um, so can we move on then to flow control? Sure can. So one of the ways I like to talk about control flow is relating it to a fast food restaurant. And I like to use this analogy because there's a lot we can learn from the way a fast food restaurant uh, sort of operates. So let's imagine that you're in your car and you go up to your favorite fast food restaurant's drive through window and you place your order. You've done one thing, but behind the scenes, a lot actually has to happen within a short time frame to get you your completed order out the door. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a naive approach. Let's say there's just one person in that restaurant and they're going to go dunk your fries in the oil, put your patty on the hot grill, prepare your bun, prepare the condiments. But that's not quite the way we do it. That'd be too slow if we just had one person do it. Instead, fast food restaurants scale up this process by having multiple people behind the scenes preparing different aspects of your order. You have one person responsible for dunking the fries in the oil. You have one person responsible for grilling the patties on the grill. You have another person responsible for assembling the bun and getting all the condiments ready. And then you have another person that's actually going to put all that food together in one bag and give it to you. That's an example of a fast food restaurant handling something that I call control flow. There needed to be a set, uh, there needed to be a set number of steps done to actually get you a completed order. And the way the fast food restaurant did it is they delegated responsibility to multiple individuals. When they all completed their task, you got the result back in one consistent package. NGRX learns a lot from the fast food model. It helps you write Angular apps that address control flow much the same way as a fast food re restaurant does it. Mm. You get to write small, well-defined modules of code that handle individual responsibilities in the control flow of your application. Mm -hmm. So when the user clicks on a button, behind the scenes, maybe your app has to do a number of different things. Mm. Using NGRX, you get to write those as separate small tasks, test those independently of each other, and you're still going to have a great user experience. They're all going to come together through its control flow implementation. Got it. Sounds to me like um, more predictability as well for everybody involved. Definitely. So what is code volume? 
it, again, this is one of the one of the things that creates complexity. Not having consistent um, control flow, not having consistent state management, and not having consistent code volume. Code volume. So code volume to me, I think, is the easiest of these three to understand because code volume really is just how many lines of code did it take me to write a certain feature or an mm -hmm. application. And I think it makes some sense that if it takes me a lot of lines of code to write, then I'm going to be a little bit slower getting that feature out the door. And if I keep adding new features to that application, the number of lines of code continues to increase and increase and increase. Eventually, you end up with a software system that's hard to maybe read, parse, dig through, or add new features to. And the time. The problem. And the time to go through it all. And the time to go through it all, yep. NGRX does a pretty poor job of addressing the code volume part mm -hmm. of complexity management. By implementing this pattern, you're going to have to pay the cost of having to write more lines of code in your organization to deliver your software application. Trade-off, though. It is a trade-off. And the trade-off can really be worth it if you are concerned about bugs coming from mishandling of state management or if you want to handle your control flow in a consistent way. I also think that the code volume problem might not be as big of an impact depending on the size of your team. For instance, if you have a team of just one to three engineers, that code volume problem can really be crippling with NGRX. But if you're talking about perhaps an enterprise size team where you've got 20 to 100 developers, even more than that working on a piece of software, code volume problems are inevitable anyways. Mm -hmm. So the architecture makes a lot of sense for those environments because if you're already going to suffer from, from code volume, then having a consistent way to handle state management and control flow is worth the trade-off. So let's, let's say, you know, um, for those engineering managers, executives that are listening, this is something that, like, states, something we're, we're struggling with. Consistency of our data flow is something we're really struggling with. Like, this might be our answer to this. Um, what are prerequisites to getting started with NGRX? And maybe you could share some best practices on, like, how to get started. So as I mentioned, the learning curve for NGRX is pretty high. If you want to get started with this, my, my recommendation to you is to bring in an outside expert on it. Hmm. They can help you sort of identify the architectural needs that you're going to need to put in place, as well as a training path to get your engineers comfortable with using NGRX. There's not going to be a faster way to get too productive with NGRX than bringing in an outside expert. Gotcha. Um, so let's say I, I do have some really talented Angular architects, maybe some really good engineers. I want to level them up. Um, we're going to take a DIY approach. We're not, we're not going to bring in a partner mm -hmm. right now, um, but we want to take a first pass as like, can these guys do this on their own? Yeah. What would be an approach to, to do that? And is there any prerequisites that, the, that my application needs to have or any version of Angular I need to be on, that kind of stuff. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. So if you already have a team of engineers or architects that are ready to start exploring in GRX, the only thing that they're going to need to do from an application perspective is make sure they're the latest version of Angular. There's no other prerequisites other than that from a software perspective. From there, the best place to get started learning in GRX is from our documentation site, ngrx.io. There's a getting started guide that will guide engineers through step-by-step how to get up to speed with NGRX. It also has links to other training resources, YouTube videos, and content that will help them sort of learn some of the nuances of NGRX. Um, another great thing that they can go to is NGRXConf. So it is a conference for engineers to learn more about NGRX. They can learn it directly from the experts, they can take a workshop at the conference, and they can hear from community leaders on sort of the best practices for implementing NGRX in their workplace. Got it, very cool. Um, Mike, thank you so much for not only describing what NGRX is, breaking down the level of complexity and how NGRX helps solve that in one small pitfall that it hasn't addressed yet in terms of how code, uh, more code needs to be put in place in order to kind of put all these um, uh, protections in place and use NGRX in the best practice. Uh, but then also just kind of helping our listeners, you know, get started. Yeah. Um, whether that's bringing in an outside uh, partner and a resource or some really practical ones that developers can use. So I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me on. So thank you for listening to us translate a very technical topic, something that is very complex in the industry. Hopefully you found a value in it. Hopefully you understood it better. Um, until next time.